could see each one of you this evening. So let me quickly go over. I've decided what format I'm going to use the rest of this week. I do appreciate the freedom given to me. Uh, sometimes you have to tell ahead of time what you uh, need to preach, and that can be good because the local congregation knows it. Uh, sometimes that cannot be good. Years ago, I was asked to speak in a meeting, and they wanted a series of lessons on the family, a small group. Trouble is, the medium age there was about 68. So it was hard teaching a series on the families when there were no families there. Their families had grown up. So I do appreciate Now, that's a rare experience, I understand, but I do appreciate this. As we discuss tonight, just a few moments, we're going to study the habit of 15. Uh, tomorrow night, I've titled the lesson, Don't Forget. We're going to look at God and his glory and, and why we should serve him. On Tuesday night, and I know looking at the cards and that you passed out material and invited others, so it's not up to you. You've sown the seed, and hopefully if you do have neighbors who have never heard the truth, uh, Tuesday would be a good night. I mean, any night would be good, but Tuesday would be a good night for them. As we look at God's dictionary and look at the topic of being called, a lot of people have unique conceptions of what it means to be called, and that's going to be on Tuesday night. On Wednesday night, I've decided there were three lessons I were going to use. You're not getting all three of them Wednesday night, so I've decided this afternoon to give a lesson titled The Difference Maker, The Difference Maker on Wednesday night. And then on Thursday night, to bring our feet back to the ground, we're going to deal with a topic titled Expecting Trouble, Expecting Trouble. And then Friday, to close the lesson, Lord willing, we'll be looking at the topic of our focus. So that's going to be the lessons that we're going to do this week. As we begin this evening, I'd ask you to turn to the book of John, chapter 20. The book of John, chapter 20, and while you're turning to that section of scripture, I want to share with you a thought I've heard over the years, and I do have an answer for the thought. Over the years, I have heard people say to me, Preacher, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Maybe you've heard it. Perhaps you've used it. And my answer to that is quite simple. First of all, I informed them I never considered them dogs. And second of all, I tried to tell them I'm not trying to teach them tricks. I'm trying to teach them how that we can be better Christians. And that leads me to the topic tonight, and that is as we deal with habits, the habit of 15. As you can see, I hope you can see, the habits we develop can be either good or bad. But fortunately, if we, and here's the key, if we have determination, we can change our bad habits and incorporate additional good habits. And if you would ask yourself the question, you probably have both good and bad habits. And I understand bad habits are hard to break, but they can be broken. And good habits, I'm glad, for instance, you brush your teeth, that's a good habit. Uh, but there are other good habits that we need to develop as time goes on, and I'm going to suggest that this evening as we look at this topic. However, before we focus, and I know you can't read the habit of 15 there, before we focus on the habit of 15, I want to just kind of do a quick review on the importance of the scriptures. Just touch on a few scriptures here. In John chapter 20, it is through the scriptures we learn about Jesus Christ. Uh, you and I are not old enough. We were not there in the first century, so we have to rely on the message that we have. And in John chapter 20, we have recorded for us in verses 30 and 31, and truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and he that believeth, and, and that believing you may have life in his name. Had it not been for the scriptures, it would be very unlikely we would be gathered together tonight, that we would not have known about Jesus Christ. By God's wisdom, he has given us the scriptures, so we learn of the one who has died for our sins. Also, we learn in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 that it's the gospel that's God's power to save. Uh, again, I think you're trying very diligent to be the light in this community. It's very easy to become discouraged as you try to reach others. And what I try to remind myself, and I want to suggest to you, that you're not the power. You're just an instrument. I'm not the power. I'm just an instrument. It's the gospel that's the power to save. Romans 1 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God's salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You remember the parable of the sower. and the parable of the sower, in Matthew chapter 13, Mark 4, Luke 8, any one of those accounts, you recall that the sower went out sowing the seed. 
Uh, remember how the sower did it. The sower did it just kind of scattering it all over. He didn't pick and choose. I think sometimes we pick and choose. I'm not saying you've done so personally, but have you ever done, and I've been guilty of this, well, they're going to make a good Christian someday. And while you're focused on the one you think is going to make good Christians, how many have we let escape that probably would have become good Christians? The point is, we are not to limit our sowing of the seed. We sow it to whomever. And, of course, the power is in God's word. Somebody will reach that word, and who knows what might happen. I recall preaching in a place one time, and the man had, on, uh, had tattoos all over his body and had earrings all over his ear. And I thought, whoa. But you know what? He turned out to be one of the best individuals I've ever met. Most friendly, kind, nice individual. And I asked him how he learned, and he explained how he learned. But you see, sometimes we would kind of say, well, look at that person. He, he's not interested. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's the gospel that's God's power to save. You say, well, was he converted and he had all those things? And yes, he was. Now, I would not wear that. I do not suggest people should wear that, but you've got to give time for people to grow. And who knows, down the road, things may change. I know things have changed with me as I, I learned the truth. I was not raised with the teachings of the truth. I was raised a Lutheran. My wife was raised a Baptist. We were married by a Methodist. So we kind of covered all bases before we came to the truth. And then we learn the truth, and we're still learning the truth as we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge. But the key is, is that the gospel is God's power to say, I'm not God's power. So you're not going to get any lessons on this is the supreme way to do personal work. There is no supreme way. It's the gospel, and it's how we interact with people. So that's what we're going to talk about that a little bit later on this week. Also, we learn in Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. Let's go to Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. On the value of the word here, we have recorded for us here in verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Now, this is a very touching scene here. If you read the whole chapter, this is Paul as he's gathered together the elders of Ephesus. He's forewarned them that there's going to be some problems at Ephesus, even perhaps of them own selves. And he's even left the idea that he probably won't see them again. But notice what he says in verse 32. I commend you to God and what? To the word of his grace. What was the word of his grace able to do? It's able to build them up. Don't ever fail to understand how important this word that we're studying, how important it is. Now the reason it's able to build us up is because where it came from. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. We're all familiar with this, I'm sure. There we have recorded for us, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Notice all of this is for that, that the man of God may be perfect, or some versions has complete, thoroughly equipped to every good work. So again, what I'm trying to point out, you see how valuable the scriptures are. And we go on just on a few more areas. It's through the scriptures I learn about the hope. Remember in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 5, John and I were talking today between, uh, with regards, I said, now remember, don't complain, the first thing I started to do, complain about our government and, and though it's going on. But we were talking about things going on in America as well as some things going on here in Canada. And thank goodness for that hope. Boy, if we didn't have that hope, we'd be in a jam, would we not? That if our, if our hope was based on temporal things, it'd be kind of rough, wouldn't it? That we would have to base our hope in men. We get to base our hope in God through Jesus Christ. And we learn of that hope where? In the scriptures. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 5, very clearly. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, look it, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. You know, why do I take time to spend the study of the gospel? Because it comes from God. It builds me up. It gives me the hope. It teaches me of the greatest love of all time. This is what the scriptures contain. And then also it's the source of judgment. In John chapter 12, years ago a number of us uh, tried to reach some people in a community called Rice Lake, Wisconsin. And we did some door-to-door -door work. And we specifically were doing door-to-door -door work asking people a specific question. And that is, in your understanding, how do you think you'll be judged? And it was interesting on the answers we got. Primarily the answer we got by the Ten Commandments. And of course we know that's not true. You and I are not going to be judged by the Ten Commandments. 
Others stated you're judged by being the type of person you are. And to some degree that has some validity, but that's not the right answer either. We find from the study of the scriptures we're going to be judged by the word of God. God is very clear about this. In John chapter 12 and verse 48, we have recorded for us here very simply, He who rejects me and does not receive my word hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now, when I look at all of these different things concerning the scriptures, then like the psalmist, I can state in Psalms 119, 162, I rejoice in your word as one who finds great treasure. Can you say that? I'm sure you can. I rejoice in your word as one who finds great treasure. Now, before we get to our lesson, let's go to part number two. We are expected to have knowledge of God's word. He didn't do all this and then give us the option. It's not optional. I've done this for a purpose. And we have passages that teach us that. In 2 Peter chapter 3, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. We have recorded for us here in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, as he closes the letter to the brethren there, very simple statement. Be but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But grow. <coughs> Who's he talking to here? He's talking to all Christians, is he not? So he expects us to grow. Again, turn with me, if you will, to Colossians 1. Actually, it should be verses 9 and 10. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1 and verses 9 and 10. There it states, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask you that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Did you see that? Two things. As you go to verse 9, be filled with the knowledge of his will. I wanted to share a story kind of silly about being filled with knowledge. Let's talk about when you were going to school. The one class I de despised going to school and, and high school and even grade school, this was a grade school time, it was history class. Did not like history class. So here's what I thought I would do. I thought, well, I'm going to just, instead of really going deep down and study, I'm going to read the chapter on a tape recorder. That's when we had to use tape recorders. Read a chapter on the tape recorder. And when I go to bed at night, I'm going to play that tape recorder under my pillow. And while I'm sleeping, all of that is going to just go into my head, and I'm going to know everything, and I'm going to just ace that test didn't work that way. doesn't work like that. You, what I'm saying is you, you can't put the Bible underneath your pillow and expect to grow. You, you can't, as you're going to bed, think that, okay, I'm going to sleep, and because you're falling asleep, now you're getting that special knowledge because you're hearing those, that, that, that's not how you grow. You, you see, to be filled with knowledge, it takes an effort on your part and my part. And it's not the effort of going to bed at night. Now, I like going to bed, but that's not how you study. That's not how you grow. So we also find that the word had the word richly dwell in us. Well, how will the word richly dwell? It doesn't come with age. Now, there are some with age who have the word richly dwelling in them because they've worked at it. But it doesn't automatically come with age. I think what worries me about the Lord's people, my spiritual family, your spiritual family, is, you know... We get excited and we can doctrinally say, okay, here's what you have to do to be saved, repent, believe, or believe, repent, confess, be baptized, be faithful. Here's the work of the church on Sundays. We come together on the first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper, to give up our means. And, you know, we get all that down pat, those basics, and then we're pretty well satisfied. Is that what happens sometimes? And then we don't grow like we should. And we learn some other things, like, and again, it's not an issue today, but it was in times past that we don't use a collective treasury for social gatherings because that's not what the Bible teaches, that it's limited for its funds. And we don't uh, have recreational facilities and baseball teams. And, and boy, and those are good things to learn. Excellent things to learn. But I think we get to a point that once we've got that, well, well, 
we've convinced ourselves we've grown. And you have, to a point. But you still need to grow. And I still need to grow. And that's what this, to have the word dwelling in me richly, I've got to keep on feeding upon it. If I don't keep on feeding upon it, it won't dwell in me richly. We need to understand what the will of the Lord is. Ephesians chapter 5, it's interesting. We are studying in the adult class upstairs at Bridgeview, the book of Revelation. Now, I've preached a series on the book of Revelation. I like doing that because nobody gets to talk with me. I, this is the first, and I've taught the book of Revelation in small study groups. Because you can have, but I've never taught the book of Revelation in a class of 45 to 55 people, and that's what we have. And I told them we're going to do chapters 1 through 3, great detail, and then we're going to jump to chapter 21. And just all it's, no, I didn't tell them that. That's what I'd like to do. But that's not how it works. And the question is, how do you understand Revelation? I mean, it's a book written in signs and symbols. And you say, well, brother so oh, yeah, that's brother so-and-so's idea of that concept there. So, so what I've tried, to, and by the way, I don't think I've got a handle of all those signs and symbols. I believe I have a handle on the message, and you do too, probably. God wins. That's it. God wins. Now, we find that before we even open up the first message, chapter 6. It's funny, book of Revelation, the signs and symbols, chapter 6. What you have in chapter 1 is Christ has now set up the kingdom. Chapters 4 and 5, God's on the throne, Christ is victorious. And then, now, what's happening? Now, we just moved into chapter 6. I told maybe that's when my car is broke. I don't have to go back for a few months. I don't know. <laughs> uh, in chapter 6, now we've started on the signs and symbols. And I said, well, okay, this is what this might be. But here's what I've done, because see, you can understand. Not that we're going to understand all this, but all the specifics of the sign and symbol. But if we take that teaching and apply it with the other scriptures we can have an understanding that we might not fully agree what the symbol actually is this i know it's not it's not teaching about a future kingdom because john was already in the kingdom in revelation 1 so people who run to revelation 20 and talk about a future kingdom being established on this earth already violates revelation more or less colossians more or less daniel which was uh, spoken in the prayer so I say that to say this. We can have a grasp. Here's what I told them as we study Revelation. Number one, you have to keep the people who are written to in, its, in, in the idea. You can't say, well, it's a book written to them in the first century, but it had nothing to do with them to 22 centuries later. <laughs> Makes no sense. Number two, you can't take the book of Revelation, which is signs and symbols, and contradict other clear teachings. If you have other clear teachings in Acts or Thessalonians or even in the... You, you can't take a symbol in Revelation and contradict the clear teaching because the clear teaching, if it's not symbolic, that's what you need to go with and you have to understand that symbol in some different way. That's where the problem comes as to exactly what the symbol is. Okay, those are the two things. And number three, you've got to be very careful on symbolism because as you go to the Old Testament, as you go to Ezekiel, as you go to Daniel, as you go to places like that, there it gives symbolism, and, and symbolism has varying degrees of understanding. But you have to ask yourself the question, and do I get so focused on that specific symbolism that I lose sight of the big picture? And therefore I approach it with that way. We've got to keep focus on the big picture. And though we will go all through all the chapters, all through chapter 22, I think they're going to learn. They're not going to walk out of there thinking, well, I know everything, because if they do, then we've got to talk about arrogance. <laughs> but I hope we can walk out of there that I know clearly what the message says and what it does, more so what it does not say, as your friends and neighbors try to misuse that. So you can have, even the book of Revelation, you can have understanding what the will of the Lord is. All right. I said all that to bring us to the point of our lesson. The habit of 15. I don't expect anyone to speak. Actually, I don't want anyone to speak, but when you went home today, did you try to think of what the habit of 15 is? The habit of 15. I know all of you are students of the Bible, but I want to suggest this. Whatever your study habits are right now, I don't want you to change them. 
I want you to improve them. Whoever you are. By a total of 15 minutes a day. The habit of 15. 15 minutes a day. That's not a big amount of time. Now, I'm not saying you replace the habit of 15 and eliminate what you're doing now. What you're doing now, whatever it is, I'm sure it's very good. But starting tomorrow, I challenge you, add the habit of 15. Now, let me illustrate that. Okay, the habit of 15. If you're consistent to add 15 minutes a day, in Chicago, you sit in traffic for 15 minutes. I mean, you can find 15 minutes. For 15 minutes a day, now 15 minutes doesn't sound like a whole lot. Watch this. 91 hours in 15 minutes. That's a lot of study time at the end of one year. In 365 days, if you are consistent in add, I'm not saying replacing, don't say, well, I did my 15 minutes, and then you quit doing something. No, no, you, you keep doing what you're doing. But now I'm challenging you, you add 15 minutes. And I say, well, Chuck, you don't know I've got kids to raise, or I've got a job. I don't have a solid 15. That's all right. Do it five-minute intervals. You got five minutes? Three times a day? Do it ten and five. Ten minutes, five minutes. Whatever. But you've got to be consistent on 15 additional minutes a day. That gives you an additional 91 hours and 15 minutes a year. Is that going to help you to grow? Who doesn't need that? I do. How about you? The habit of 15. Now, let's illustrate it. Okay, Monday. Now, you don't have to do what I put on the board. I'm just giving you an idea. Monday, pick a memory verse. Wait a minute, Chuck. Pick a memory verse? That's for kids. Why is that for kids? Well, I'm too old. No, what? You, are you going to do that again? You're not too old. Pick a memory verse. I've never done that before. That's all right. Well, if you were to do that once a week, Better yet, maybe you don't learn in a week. Say once a month. That's 12 verses a year. And if you live three years, that's 36 verses. And you're not memorizing those verses to impress others. You're memorizing those verses to help you live. Remember we talked about the tongue? Any verses you could memorize on the tongue? Sure there are. Maybe you're dealing with some type of religious error. Any verses to memorize there? You know, I'm told... And I don't know if this is true because I wasn't raised with the teachings of the church. I'm told in years past, God's people were looked at as Bob, Bible or walking Bible encyclopedias. I, I hate to say it, we can't say that today, can we? Isn't that sad? We need to be diligent. We need to we need to develop. We need to set goals. I know people don't like to hear, why, you can't, li I had one brother tell me, Chuck, you can't limit God. I'm not trying to limit God. I'm trying to expand your horizon. Trust me, I, I don't come anywhere near God. But you've got, if you, well, my goal is to grow. That's noble. Now, in what areas? You see, to grow doesn't help. You've got to become more specific. And in the habit of 15, you've got to become specific. I illustrate, okay, pick a memory verse. Maybe you're studying Acts. So after you do that and write it down, review passages on Acts. On salvation, maybe you're having trouble with passing out. So review, I didn't say you had to memorize all those passages, but review. So you can take them to Acts 8. You can take them to Acts 2. You can take them to Acts 16. You can take them to Acts 10. That you know exactly where to go if that... That might be the situation. That's Monday. Might want to write it down, because usually for me, if I write something down, it causes to take my brain more. Then on Tuesday, go over the memory verse, because I don't memorize it one day. It takes me more than one day. I don't have a photojudge memory. Review the lessons. Maybe you got the lesson from the other day. Now, if you got time, maybe go to Genesis. Write a brief summary. 
You know, we've all studied this. If you've been in Christ any length of time, you've studied all 66 books of the Bible. You know, we go after book, after book, after book, after book, and that's good. Now, what do you remember about those books? You see, if you don't go over them, you're not going to remember anything. Cobwebs are going to sit in. Well, to get the cobwebs up, just kind of one day, do Genesis. Quick review. If you can't do that, put it down on a piece of paper. It's a major thing in the book of Genesis, major things in the book of Exodus, major things in the book of Leviticus. You, you get the point. I'm not saying you do that all in one day. I'm just saying, don't tell me there's not ways to grow. I mean, there's so many options that you can do in the habit of 15. It's mind-boggling. Uh, as you go on, on Wednesday, review memory verse, study various lessons, and now take 1 Timothy, a different book. What do I learn in 1 Timothy chapters 1 through 6? Is there an important lesson for me to learn? Maybe two lessons to learn. What can I? So I spend time, write a brief summary in the book. So you got that little book, you write that brief summary. Okay, coming to Thursday, review memory. So I'm still on that first memory verse, but that's all right. One a week, that's not one a month. Actually, that'd be one a week. Wow, that's 52 verses a year. Wow. Times 10 years, 520. Times 20 years, times 30 years. You see, a brother, that's an additional 15 minutes, people, is nothing. We spend more than 15 minutes, if you watch TV, watching commercials. If you edit all the time you watch commercials, it's more than 15 minutes a day. I'm talking 15 minutes of profitable time. But you've got to have a goal. You can do. Now, I'm not making fun that you're not students of the Bible. I'm sure you are. So I hope no one takes offense. I'm just showing how can we improve more? How can you and I, regardless of what age we are, can we improve more? Okay. Then you write down the brief summary. Let's move on. On Friday, remove review memory verse. New Testament passage, books that relate to salvation. Again, you go on Saturday, memory verse. Maybe book of Philippians. A lot of people get depressed. First book comes to my mind, Philippians. One, two, three, four. Which which chapter do you want to take? That can't help someone if they're depressed. You see, so you see, yeah. No, not to mention you might want to add maybe on what you're studying. Add that into there. You know, on your Tuesday or Wednesday, we meet on Tuesday. Though you meet on Wednesdays, I'm not sure. On your Wednesday study, or add on your Sunday Sunday study. But the point is, we do a lot of talk, but no practice. And I hear people say, well, you don't understand. I just don't have the time. I don't buy it. What happens is we've not developed good habits. We've not been taught, and I'm no supreme example of we've not been taught how to study. We've been given a Bible say study. Or you've been given a Tuesday, to, a Wednesday lesson, a Sunday lesson, and all you do is go to fill out the answers to the lesson. And then you can come to class and you got the answers. No disrespect. Big deal. Big deal. Anyone can get answers to a study question. I, I like study questions. I use study questions. How's it affecting your life? You see, that's the point. Why do I even take the time to study this book? Because it affects my life. It helps me in Hebrews 5. Turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 5. It helps me to make choices. Notice they were being rebuked because they hadn't grown like they should. In Hebrews 5 and verse 12, For, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only in the milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. I, I want to stop here for a moment. Don't think you're skilled because there's just simply a lot of discussion. I think sometimes we deceive ourselves. Or we're knowledgeable because we did a lot of discussion. Because a lot of discussion might not amount to anything. Your skill is when you can put what you've studied into application. That's skill. Not just that you can discuss Ezekiel, or you can discuss Proverbs, or you can discuss Leviticus. I'm not against that. But to be skilled, you know how to apply God's teachings to your life. Now, how do you get that there, Chuck? I'm glad you asked. I thought you might, so let's go on and continue reading. 
But solid food belongs to those who are full age, that is, those who by reason of what? Use. Have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. See that? By reason of use, they get to determine. That's going to tie in with our lesson on Thursday, but I won't go any more than that. So important that we follow. Yeah, you can say, well, the habit of 15, I don't like it. That's fine. You don't, you don't have to follow. But then I challenge you to do this. What are your specific goals for your growth? Where are you at? I would assume most, if not all, I'm not exactly sure, but most of you are Christians. And that's good. Now what? Now that you're what do you hope to accomplish this year before this year? And this year's almost over, a couple more months. What do you hope to accomplish? Do you know about the plan of salvation to teach others? Do you, do you know about the tongue? What about your weaknesses? We all have weaknesses. Do you know the passages that will help you with those weaknesses? Do you know Bible examples of, that can help you with those weaknesses? You, you see my point? There, there's so many apps. You don't have to. You, I'm not saying you have to follow my format, format, but I'm just saying if you do as little as that, as little as that, you see what happens. But here's the key. The key is we've got to be consistent. We can't do it for a week or two weeks and then give up. Now, here's the warning. Maybe you do it for a month and then you miss a day. Don't give up. Get back on course. Do it again. Maybe you miss two days. Don't give up. Get back on course. Don't be like Nick who quit the race. Get back in the race and keep on running. And what happens if you keep on doing that? You get back in. You do Guess what? You are going to develop that habit of 15 or who knows, habit of 20, whatever you decide, above and beyond your other study practices. And that's going to help you to be a better Christian. It's going to help you to be able to reach others. It's going to help you to live better. And therefore, as we close this evening, let's go to Psalms 119. Psalms 119. And verse 93. Never thought you'd get a homework assignment in a gospel meeting, did you? Whether you do anything with it, it's up to you. But there's an assignment for you. And Psalms 119, verse 93. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Now, dropping down to verses 97 through 105. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your thought, you through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Usually we only read 105. You see, all this leads up to 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Oh, I am so thankful to God for his word. And I've got so much more to study. Even the simple things I said. I don't try to read things into it, but it just kind of all ties together. The more you do it, the more it ties together. And the more it ties together, the easier it is for me to sit down with people. And not that they're going to accept it. But you know, this is the thing Albert Wan has taught me as I sat at his feet years ago. He said, Chuck, when you sit down and study with somebody, you, you give them scripture and use the scripture properly. And you know what? If they want to disagree, point out it in a way, nice way, that they're disagreeing with scripture. They're not disagreeing with you. They're disagreeing with the word of God. And they say, well, that's just your understanding. No, God's not the author of confusion. And one quick point on that. Here's what I do when people say, that's just my understanding. I'll ask them this. Do you understand that Jesus is the Christ? And what do you, what do you think they tell me? Yes. Do you understand that Jesus died for my sins? What do you they think they tell me? Yes. Do you understand that Jesus went home to his Father in heaven? What do they tell me? Yes. I said, how come we can understand that? How, how, do, how are we able to all, both of us agree on those things? 
from what? The scriptures. Then why don't you understand the plan of salvation? You know what I've learned? People have to be helped to misunderstand. They have to be helped to misunderstand. The scriptures are very clear that you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's what they were told on the day of Pentecost. We'll learn more about that on Tuesday night. After they were baptized, they need to continue in the apostles' doctrine. as what you're doing tonight. You need to grow. We need to be doers of the word and not hearers only. You know, the Bible is like a mirror. James chapter 1, verses 21 through 25. The trouble is, when we leave the mirror, we forget how we look. I'll, I'll never forget years and years ago when I was preaching in Florida, one of the members were sickly, and I was asked to go to the hospital very early. And again, some people, and I don't mind going to the hospital, but they kind of misconstrue with a denominational concept. But I went to the hospital to be with this, this one who was a member of the Lord's body. And in my haste, it was very early in the morning, in my haste, I failed to shave a section of my face. So I had gotten in my car, I'd gotten to the hospital, and while I'm waiting to go in the room, I walk up, I must have looked like a clown, walk up and I have this shaving cream right just in one section of my face there. And finally, one of the relatives said, Chuck, what's the matter? And I said, nothing, you know, first thing she said, what's the matter? I'm checking to make sure my zipper's up and my coat's on. And she said, the side of your face, what's that on the side of your face? And I said, shave cream. But you see, had I been looking in the mirror, what would I have seen? I would have saw that shave cream and I would have taken it off, right? Or shaved it like I should have done. But when I left the mirror, I forgot. Here's the point. When I leave the mirror, I forget how I need to live. That's why we've got to grow in grace and knowledge of the truth. If you're here, something gospel call, won't you come as we stand and as we stand?